Well, welcome, Kevin, to Flora Funga Podcast. I, like I was saying, I haven't done like a holiday episode before, and I thought this would be really cool to touch on the Amanita or fly agaric type of mushroom and kind of why that's related with Christmas. Um, I know some people kind of know the history of that, but I wanted to get a specialist and a person who um, actually wrote a book on this type of mushroom. So can you just kind of introduce yourself and how you even got into funga? Uh, sure. Uh, well, thank you for having me, uh, yes. first of all. And uh, well, mushrooms have been a long time interest um, since I was a teenager and uh, had my first experiences with uh psychedelic substances and that's kind of when i became interested um interestingly I, I would say that you know as a teenager uh i think like a lot of teenagers um mm -hmm. it was not a, a a great time for me and i was not uh you know particularly interested in school or anything like that mm -hmm. uh, but but after having some of these experiences, I became extremely interested in, in biology and, and chemistry and Ooh. plants and religion and folklore. So suddenly it, it kind of, it kind of sparked something where I, you know, I became, I think, re-engaged mm. uh, in a way that I hadn't been before. Um, and so that really led to my interest in, in learning more uh, about mushrooms, among other things, uh, which then led to me learning about, you know, all types of edibles and being able to, you know, go out in the woods and come home and make, you know, a fantastic meal. Um, and I think that's similar to a lot of people. I think a mm -hmm. lot of people are drawn in. Um, you know, by maybe a psychedelic experience. And then they discover that there's so much more <laughs> to know about and learn about and enjoy. Um, and, and so that was kind of the root of it. And with the fly agaric uh, specifically, mm -hmm. uh, I remember my, my folks had, you know, a handful of mushroom books and they hadn't done any foraging for years, but at, at one point had, you know, been foragers and would go collect wild mushrooms, but mm -hmm. they still had these books. And, you know, so I was flipping through and I recognized the fly agaric, of course, from, um, you know, kids' books yep. and cartoons, uh, you know, particularly kind of fantasy and fairy tale ones. Yes. Um, and started kind of reading about it and learning about it. And as I was getting interested in, in similar types of substances, uh, I felt that this was one that rightly or wrongly, I felt that this was one that I would be able to identify mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as opposed to the more popular psilocybes, uh, which take a, a higher degree of, of yeah. skill to identify. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say, oops, sorry about that. Uh, and that's not to say that there aren't uh, lookalikes and uh, mm -hmm. potential difficulties with identifying the fly agaric and, and other mushrooms, because there are. Okay, um, so they're all, uh, are they mostly the red and white one or is there also some that are different color but still categorized as that? Well, so the fly agaric is interesting because it's most recognized in its red form, mm -hmm. um, but it can be red or orange or yellow okay. or peach mm -hmm. uh, or even white. Okay. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, there are different varieties and subspecies of the fly agaric, which is Ammonita muscaria. Mm -hmm. And the different uh, varieties and subspecies tend to be associated with a particular kind of cap color. Um, but in, in my experience, uh, you find often find the full range of colors uh, within um, you know, a variety or, or subspecies. Okay. 
Wow. Yeah. And that's really interesting how you kind of got into it by a get like people use gateway drug as like getting into different things, but you use that as like getting into knowledge, which is really interesting. I feel like I did the same thing, mm-hmm. knowing that a lot of drugs are made from plants or um, stuff like that. So that is interesting how it's a different gateway. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It was a very, it was a very interesting experience, and I was, you know, I was raised in, in the just say no era, mm-hmm. and and so a lot of those things were, were confusing, you know, at the time to figure out about, you know, I felt like I was having a positive experience, but society was telling me mm. that I was having a negative experience. <laughs> And, mm-hmm. and so as a young person, it's really hard to kind of reconcile uh, some of those things. Um, and sometimes it just takes kind of life experience and maturity to, to get some uh, yeah. insight yeah. into some of those things. Yeah, definitely. So we kind of touched on what the flag Eric looks like, that typical toadstool that you think of. Um, but why is it important? Well, that's... I mean, that's an interesting question and Mm -hmm. we get into, um, you know, I, the field of psychedelics and this kind of psychedelic subculture. Mm -hmm. And so on one hand, there is a enthusiasm that people have, uh, and often with that enthusiasm, um, people get kind of, um, I guess, mushroom vision <laughs> where, <laughs> where they tend to see kind of mushrooms everywhere they look. Ah, yes. Um, and, you know, and some of those things are, are kind of interesting speculations and some of them may lead places and, and others don't, but there's mm-hmm. kind of that enthusiasm that, that feeds um, kind of those associations. And, so we can talk about that in a little bit in mm-hmm. regards to kind of the the Santa mythos, mm-hmm. um, but I think it it is a very uh, interesting substance. Um, we know that there's traditional use uh, among several uh, indigenous peoples in Siberia. Um, there's evidence uh, of historical use in in Mexico um, and Central America. Um, And then there's a bunch of sort of things you might consider Easter eggs of of things you see here and there that look like, gosh, that that seems very suggestive of something, Um, but we don't necessarily have anything concrete. Okay, I like a good Easter egg. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I think it's interesting for a lot of reasons. And, and of course, there's been this ongoing interest in kind of the, you know, psychedelic underground or culture and in investigating the connections between uh, psychedelics, uh, religious, religious experience mm-hmm. and the origins uh, of religion. So that's definitely... Wow. A, a focus for a lot of people. And so I think there is, um, you know, a search for that. And, yeah. and one of the places where the flag Garrick then comes up um, is in the ancient Indian text uh, known as the Rig Veda, uh, which was written several thousand years ago. Wow. And uh, Gordon Wasson proposed his, his kind of now well-known theory that the fly Garrick or Ammonite Muscaria was the, the central uh, visionary um, sacrament that's mm. described in the book uh, that's called Soma. Wow. Wow. So yeah, it, it does go back quite a ways. Is that what kind of got you into writing um, the book or yeah, explain? Yeah, well, I think I've had a, um, a long-term interest in in the mushroom, and I had read a lot of Gordon Wasson's work mm-hmm. uh, and Clark Heinrich's book uh, that was written back in the '90s or, or early 2000s. 
um, and some of the work of uh, Jonathan Ott, who did a lot of research on the fly agaric. Uh, and then there just was not a lot of information, you know, mm. for, uh, and you really had to dig to find papers written on the fly agaric that seem to be substantive and and were interesting okay and so one of my goals really was uh essentially to assemble the book that I had always wanted for yes. myself I like that uh so, so you write a book right so it was, it was the book I never had the mm-hmm. book I always wanted and I thought you know there are um you know the majority of the book is is new material uh, but there were also these great articles that I had come across uh, that were, you know, out of print or hard to find mm-hmm. and hard to get, and that I thought really were worthy of, of being read and and shared with a greater audience. Um, so, so in the book, I, I wanted to kind of expand the the knowledge base, bring in a lot of different kind of authors and researchers. Mm-hmm. Um, but also to highlight some of these um, papers that had been written and, and had never um, just kind of got lost to time. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you could put it in one place and um, for everybody to see it. So could you say what the title of your book is? Yes, uh, it is. Uh, it's a long Fly title. <laughs> is. Fly Garrick is the main title. Mm-hmm. So Fly Garrick, a compendium of history, pharmacology, mythology, and exploration. I love all of that. Yeah. So I, I really wanted to, you know, the goal was to really produce something that was comprehensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, with with a mushroom like the Fly Garrick, it's really not possible to, to cover everything because there's mm-hmm. so much. But I really wanted to you know, what are the things that people want to know, right? They want to know what do they look like? How do you find them? Where do you Mm -hmm. find them? They want to know how does it work and why does it work? They want to know what are the historical kind of connections uh, and the mythology and Mm -hmm. religious connections. Um, And then also, you know, it, if prepared in a certain way, Mm -hmm. it can also be cooked and and served as a food that is not um, inebriating. Um, so there's a lot of different angles to come mm-hmm. at it. Uh, and I, I wanted to at least uh, cover kind of each angle. Yeah. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. So let's, let's uh, dive into some of these specific topics. Sure. Um, let's see, which one do you think would be the best, maybe starting with the scientific part? Um, maybe like, explain kind of the ecology or the mycology of the amanita or fly agaric okay so the uh the fly agaric is a uh northern hemisphere mushroom Mm -hmm. um at least natively and uh it's fairly cosmopolitan it occurs you know all around the northern hemisphere um there are different varieties and subspecies of the mushroom, uh, but it's fairly, you know, prolific and recognizable. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has been introduced into places like Australia and oh. South America, um, but is actually um, considered invasive. Okay, so it um, actually is uh, prolif- proliferating there, or is it... Yeah, so it oh, okay. is. It can be found. Uh, it can be found in different parts of Australia and uh, in different parts of uh, South America too. I don't know exactly okay. what what the full range is, mm-hmm. um, but one of the things that's happened is the uh, Amanita muscaria is what we call a mycorrhizal mushroom, mm-hmm. which means. Uh, it lives and grows in symbiosis with a tree host. Yep. Um, so this is one of the reasons why it can't be cultivated. Got it. Is because it has to grow in connection with a particular tree. Okay. 
Uh, I know people are, are trying very hard uh, to to make the mushroom uh, create that relationship with trees, you know, on their properties and things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how how successful that has been. <laughs> um, so it is it is mycorrhizal, and it prefers, you know, it was a long thought that it preferred only a few different hosts uh, like birch uh, and pine and some others. Um, but it really doesn't seem to discriminate uh, too much. Uh, Good mushroom. It, yeah, it seems to make friends with a <laughs> lot of trees. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief bit on kind of the ecology. It, mm -hmm. it is kind of um, throughout, certainly throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And oh, and so that was my point about the mycorrhizal is that um, what happens is people in Australia import trees from oh. Europe and same in uh, you know South America so they import trees for landscaping or whatever mm -hmm. and when the trees arrive it's already has that partnership oh, with the mushroom. That's how it's happening too okay. And so that's how it's getting introduced Got it. it's being introduced through imported trees. Well um, bonus. So yeah, so often um, uh, people find them on on kind of, you know, plantations in Australia where there's mm -hmm. lots of, you know, pine or, you know, something like that. Okay. Hmm. Awesome. And then, so why is that mushroom kind of like the poster child for, like, if people say mushroom, they usually think of, like, this fly agaric. Do you have a reason why most people just like and why is it the poster it's, child for it's it? really interesting i mean it's really uh quite iconic mm -hmm. uh i had a, a friend send me a photo recently of um their local co-op they had uh in the produce section mm -hmm. they had a picture of you know a cartoon of a fly agaric next to where the mushrooms are <laughs> and you're thinking well this is really weird because yes. this is not typically considered a, an edible mushroom mm -hmm. it, it's typically considered poisonous yes and for it to be the the iconic representation of a mushroom and uh featured next to you know the button mushrooms the edible. Store, oh boy. The, you know, a little as a strange juxtaposition. Um, and then the other thing I've seen too is in online, you know, discussion boards or on Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, the icon or emoji for mushroom is the fly Garrick. Yes. And it gets a little confusing because people are having these discussions about psilocybe mushrooms oh. and they're using this icon for a mushroom that is not. I mean, it's very different mm -hmm. uh, from the psilocybes. Uh, so it gets a little confusing sometimes about, well, what are you, oh. what is it that you're talking about? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. That is cool. Hmm. Yeah, that is weird. I, I think that's the first mushroom that I also, I guess, recognized too. When mm. I was at my grandparents' house, I was like, whoa, what is that huge? It was a uh, Amanita type, but I'm not sure which one it was. But yeah, I was like, whoa, I had to get down on the ground and like get close to it because uh, I was like, and then I think after that, I did realize that there was more mushrooms around me. So you're right. It is one of those starter mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, I think the Ammonitas as a genus, they mm -hmm. tend to have a very kind of majestic kind of regal stature, mm. yeah. uh, you know, across the board. Uh, and then when you throw in kind of that, that crimson bright red color. That's true. And with the, you know, the decoration of, you know, the white spots or, mm -hmm. or warts it's it's really eye-catching mm -hmm. um and you know and so you look at the representation of it in fairy tales and you know so clearly there's an aesthetic to it mm -hmm. and then there's also there's also just this weird question of well it's in these fantasy pictures of you know fairies and gnomes and elves and and it's also you know highly <laughs> 
a hallucinogenic mushroom. So there's always kind of a question of, well, why did this connection? Is this mm. simply an aesthetic connection or, or is there some other yeah, connection there as well? Like a chicken or the egg situation. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's really hard to kind of tease that apart. Mm. Okay. So then kind of the history with it, how did it all start? How, how did this all become a well-known mushroom? Mm. Um, well, so I guess in the 20th century, if we're talking about kind of psychoactive or, or psychedelic mushrooms, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the, in the 50s uh, is when Gordon Wasson um, took his famous trip to Mexico and he participated in a traditional uh, mushroom velada in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico with Maria Sabina, okay. which is now kind of the famous kind of introduction of, you know, the quote unquote West to uh, magic mushrooms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he later on in the late sixties went on to write um, his most well-known work, which was the book Soma, uh, which puts forth the theory that the fly agaric is this ancient uh, sacrament named Soma. Um, and so, so he, Wasson really uh, was kind of at the center of um, kind of creating and expanding awareness uh, of these different types of mushrooms and, and the properties that they mm-hmm. had. Um, of course, there are, you know, he's not the sole individual or, or the discoverer uh, per se, but he mm-hmm. was really central in kind of popularizing or creating awareness uh, about these different substances. Um, and of course, in the 70s, people figured out that they could grow psilocybes uh, at home. And, and so that really kind of took off uh, in the 70s and, uh, and after. Uh, and of course, the the fly agaric could never be cultivated. Mm-hmm. Um, the fly agaric is also um, uh, more finicky, I guess. <laughs> it's a little trickier to figure out than the psilocybes. Okay. Um, and one of the reasons that that Wasson was sort of criticized for his theory about soma is he talks about um, or examines these ancient texts, um, particularly the Rig Veda. And the Rig Veda describes a somewhat elaborate process for preparing this Soma sacrament. Okay. So a lot of people came out and said, look, it's a mushroom. What, you know, why don't they just eat it? Why are they, you know... Um, why are they putting it in water? Why are they extracting it? Why are Mm -hmm. they doing these different steps? And it turns out that the Ammonitum muscari is not like psilocybe mushrooms. Uh, You know, the chemistry is different. Mm. uh, And so the preparation of it is different. Um, So there's really been kind of in, in the West, a big question mark about this mushroom because there's been a lot of misunderstandings. A lot of people think it's going to be like psilocybe mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Uh, And (laughs) so a lot of people are either disappointed when they take it um, or they get scared off by it um, because it is, it is quite different. Okay. Um, And how is it different? um, Well, (laughs) <laughs> for one it can it can cause people to get uh extremely nauseous mm-hmm. and potentially sick um if it's prepared correctly that can typically be avoided okay um but when people you know throughout you know the end of the 20th century are experimenting with this mm-hmm. they don't know how to prepare it they don't they know that the chemistry is different well, some of them do. <laughs> um, 
but you know, so Gordon Watson himself never had um, a deep experience with the mushrooms. Um, Terrence McKenna tried them because he wanted to figure out what Watson's theory is all about. Mm-hmm. And he had a terrible experience and, you know, and said, you know, basically sort of wrote them off as being kind of worthless. Mm. And so there's been this kind of attitude towards these mushrooms of being kind of second tier or or not as interesting or as powerful um, as psilocybes. and of course, anybody who's had a deep and powerful experience with the flag, Eric, would would dispute that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, to a great degree. Uh, so there's been a lot of confusion about the mushroom, how it works, mm-hmm. how to use it. Uh, and and it's just, it's a different mushroom. It's not a psilocybin. Um, so I think there's been a lot of confusion there. And there's been renewed interest and particularly in the last five years um particularly as people have figured out uh effective ways to to work with it got it so you kind of have to prepare it to be different and yeah treat it differently right and and so that's that's been kind of the the uh you know kind of the previous paradigm was just to treat it like a psilocybin you know mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a med it falls into this category of magic mushrooms got it so you should be able to use it the same way um but it's really it's it's really its own mm. animal so to speak okay <laughs> its own mushroom definitely so then talking into like the pharmacology aspect i've heard that i know like some people uh, have it in their pee so then you can like recycle that how how is the preparation or like how is the the pharmacology aspect to this mushroom okay uh so in in the psilocybes you have uh tryptamines okay. uh psilocybin and psilocin and the uh a lot of the common or well-known uh hallucinogens or psychedelics are are tryptamine based Got it. Um, and in the fly agaric, you have something called uh, isoxazoles. Okay. Uh, and these are ebotenic acid and muscimol. Mm-hmm. So this is a totally different uh, group of compounds. Yeah. Um, they target different receptors in the brain. Okay. Um, so these work on the GABA system in the brain. Uh, Whereas the tryptamines tend to interact with the serotonin systems uh, okay. in the brain. So we're activating different parts of the brain. Mm-hmm. Um, so the ebotenic acid uh, breaks down into muscimol, which is the more potent of the two. They're both psychoactive. Okay. Um, and both compounds. Uh, are, are released in the urine because they're not fully, um, not fully metabolized yep. or incorporated uh, into the system. Okay. So, so this is one of the things that was reported out of Siberia, uh, you know, when Western explorers or um, military regiments were out there, you know, hundreds of years ago, they'd mm-hmm. say, these people are drinking their pee, you know, and it's weird. <laughs> um, uh, so this is, one of the traditional practices of it and so through the drinking of urine Mm -hmm. somebody can prolong their experience uh, with the mushroom and there were also accounts of how uh, poor people who couldn't afford the mushrooms Mm. would go gather urine of rich people and then use that uh, to get inebriated themselves got it and, you know, so occasionally this comes up in, you know, online discussion boards and usually it's, you know, a joke or people making fun of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we're kind of stuck in, in a Western framework where we see this as gross or disgusting. Mm-hmm. Um, but it kind of made sense in an environment where uh, the mushroom is maybe not 
as prolific as it is in other parts of the world. Right. Uh, so it's a way of conserving and prolonging, mm -hmm. um, you know, access to the mushroom. Mm -hmm. And so how, um, how do people usually take it now versus um, before? Is there a real difference? Well, so one of the things that people focus on is trying to convert the ebotenic acid into muscimol. Mm -hmm. uh, be one, because muscimol is more potent than ebotenic acid. Um, and two, there are kind of question marks uh, around ebotenic acid for a couple reasons. One is it appears to be uh, associated with some of the more negative effects like nausea and, and vomiting. And so people mm -hmm. trying to reduce the impact on their GI system yes. <laughs> are wanting to make that conversion. Um, it's also, um, ebotenic acid is also a tool that's used in um, neurology and it's used as a, a brain lesioning mechanism. Um, so if injected directly into the brain, uh, it can cause lesions wow. in different parts of the brain, uh, which is then useful for people that are studying uh, neuroanatomy and neurological okay. processes. Wow. So there's, there's sort of this sense that, you know, oh, if I take this, I'm going to get brain damage. Mm -hmm. um, but there's you know, there's not really, um, there's not really any good information to make that kind of leap from, you know, injecting, you know, ebotenic acid into the brain of mice okay. and somebody who, you know, drinks a tea made of the whole mushroom. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you can't really compare uh, the two different types of ingestion. Right. Uh, and then if you are comparing across species as well, you're, you're making a number of leaps that just don't really give us any good information. Oh, okay. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, this isn't a, a great example, but, um, you know, we all, you know, drink milk or other things like that, but probably we wouldn't inject it into our brains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, I, I don't know <laughs> what impact that would have uh, on the brain, um, but I don't know that whatever impact that have would have would would inform um, inform us about the impact it would have if we ingest it in the yes. normal way. It's totally different, I, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Wow. And so there's uh, serotonin and then there's the GABA. What is kind of the difference with the feel then? Because serotonin is kind of like the, the happy drug or happy um, mm. feel. And then what would uh, GABA kind of be compared well, so, with? So GABA is interesting. It's, it's uh, kind of more of a whole, it's a broader system really. Okay. Um, but it's also where, uh, uh, like alcohol and benzodiazepines mm -hmm. work. Okay. Uh, so one of the things you see with the fly agaric that you don't see with other, um, psychedelic type compounds mm -hmm. is that the fly agaric can affect, um, coordination. Okay. Uh, and so it can cause people to be kind of uh woozy or, or imbalanced okay. um as if they'd had you know a few drinks got it um so it adds so it's a you know that's a different aspect of it yeah too. definitely um you know under other psychedelics people might think that they are walking funny whether they are or not mm -hmm. um but with the fly agaric it could actually impact Whoa you know, your ability to walk a, a straight line or, yeah. wow. <laughs> or stand up depending on 
on how much you've taken. Okay. Uh, so it does inter- it interacts with the brain and the body in in different ways. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, that is crazy. It's like a whole body type of thing versus more, I guess, mind but kind of body. I'm yeah. Right. So that is interesting. There's a difference. So one of the interesting things about that is you know like other compounds that we broadly put into this hallucinogenic or psychedelic category Mm -hmm. uh it's Mm non-addictive um so this opens up some interesting possibilities because now we have uh a compound that acts um on similar parts of the brain as you know alcohol and benzodiazepines which both are anxiety reducers Mm -hmm. um but is not addictive uh, and doesn't lead to, you know, severe withdrawals and things yeah, like that. That is. Um, so people are finding that in small amounts, mm-hmm. uh, it can have a, a productive anti-anxiety uh, effect. Yes. Uh, and there are, you know, the, the research hasn't been done yet, mm-hmm. uh, but anecdotally, uh, there is evidence that, that people, um, uh, have used it and, and can use it to help them uh, okay. come off of uh, benzodiazepines and, and other compounds that can be uh, extremely uh, addictive and destructive. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I will definitely have to circle back for the future of this because I think that's super interesting and one of my biggest questions. Um, but I want to ask about the animals and what other animals consume these mushrooms with us okay so (laughs) so reindeer uh, are are known to eat these uh i believe deer have been seen to eat these Mm -hmm. um and often if you find them in the woods you'll find nibble marks on them yes (laughs) (laughs) So there's always a question of, well, what's <laughs> what's <laughs> been here? Um, so I think there there are a variety of animals that that ingest it to some mm. extent. Um, there is a famous picture of a fox eating one, um, but my understanding is that the the fox was lured uh, to the mushroom with peanut butter or something like that uh, in order in order to get the it's really an amazing photograph but then it's also also that kind of illusion of well this isn't really part of a fox's diet got it got it it was Um, (laughs) clickbaity and then speaking of animals eating Mm -hmm. mushrooms there is a I guess it's not a famous movie, but it, it came out when I was a kid, but this movie called The Bear, okay, um, which I don't know if it, I, I want to say it came out in the 80s, but it might have been early 90s. Um, and it's, you know, I don't know if it's Disney, but it's one of those Disney-esque animal okay. movies of a baby animal lost its mom and it's the journey. And then as part of the journey, it finds one of these mushrooms. And then there's, so there's a little scene of this bear, <laughs> you know, hallucinating after oh it my gosh. one of these mushrooms. The bear. And I don't, um, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Okay. So there is a couple of other animals uh, along with us, and that kind of can go into the myth, uh, mythology of this mushroom and kind of, um, could that play a part with the reindeer and the, and Santa's journey and how how is um, the whole Christmas thing um, play a part in this mushroom? Okay, so my I'll I'll get into this, but my my caveat mm-hmm. is that that this is one of those areas where the the people that are excited about the connections are. Mm-hmm a little too ready to accept them Mm -hmm. and (laughs) the people that are skeptical of the whole story are also too ready to dismiss okay so this caveat yeah so it's one of these interesting things where you'll see these things on 
online and discussion boards or Facebook where somebody posts, you know, one of these stories or videos about Mm -hmm. the fly Garrick being the Santa Claus mushroom. And then Mm -hmm. inevitably somebody posts, no, you're stupid. Here's this other video about how this is all wrong. And, and it's, they're, they're both kind of unfortunate paths because the, the truth is always more complex and more mysterious and, mm. and more intriguing. Uh, so with that uh, caveat, mm-hmm. the, the traditional sort of analysis uh, is broken down in several ways. One, you have Santa Claus who is, you know, dressed in red and white, which are mm-hmm. the iconic fly agaric colors um he has kind of this ruddy rosy complexion um which can be caused by somebody ingesting the fly agaric um he has reindeer and reindeer are known to eat these mushrooms mm-hmm. um and some people report having sensations of of flying under the influence of the mushroom. So then the idea is that, okay, so now you have (laughs) flying reindeer. Okay. Right. (laughs) Right. Um, And so these are kind of the main, the main tenets of, of this hypothesis and, and it goes on. And so you can Mm -hmm. say, okay, well, the mushrooms are mycorrhizal, which means they grow at the base of trees. So it grows like a Christmas present. Mm. Um, and they're often in traditional cultures, they are air dried or sun dried. So they might be strung together on a string. They might be, you know, kind of left, uh, on a branch of a tree, Mm -hmm. sort of like a Christmas decoration, Mm -hmm. or they might be hung over the fireplace, like a stocking to, to dry it out. Mm -hmm. So there's these different connections. and, And the last kind of significant one is that, um, in, in, uh, some shamanic cultures, um, you know, particularly in the North, I believe this is in the Sami that do this will come through kind of the, the shaman might come through the chimney mm. of kind of the yurt or the building. Okay. Uh, and so there's this other kind of, kind of connection here. Um, so, so the first The first problem, uh, of course, is that the red and white uh, color scheme Mm -hmm. is relatively recent. Um, So this was kind of introduced in the the 1860s um, in some illustrations in in Harper's Magazine. And then it was later picked up by uh, Coca-Cola in the 1930s. And I guess at that time, they weren't able to, um, I'll have to look back into it for for more details, but I believe they weren't allowed to kind of include children in the imagery uh, for their their product. Okay. And so the way then to appeal to children who would be a natural audience for a sugary drink is, you know, to use Santa Claus. Um, And so you have you know, the the Coca-Cola brand has really um, kind of universalized a a very specific image of Santa Claus. Okay. Um, And and so it's interesting because Santa Claus is a figure that has existed, you know, for a long time, but in different permutations, mm-hmm. um, you know, particularly across Europe. And, um, you know, so he's always a little bit different, you know, from culture to culture. Mm-hmm. And one of the other difficulties is that, you know, the the idea of Santa Claus is not an idea that that can be traced to a specific time and place, right? Yes, right. It's not like he's a man who was born at a specific time. So, you know, we can look at these different kind of motifs 
and different imagery that we associate with Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. But these were not, they didn't all spring into creation at the same time. Yep, got it. Right? Mm -hmm. So so when we look at the different um, pieces of the puzzle, you have to think, okay, well, this piece might have come a couple hundred years after this Mm. other piece. And so trying to make any cohesive argument that the whole thing yes is based on a mushroom is just it's implausible you know at best um which is not to say that there aren't influences Mm -hmm. right right so i think we can say we can look and say okay i think there's a connection here it's not the you know end all be all explanation of where Santa Claus comes from Mm -hmm. because Santa Claus is um is really an an evolutionary figure uh meaning that uh, who Santa is depends on where you are and what year it is that's true that's very true (laughs) wow so So the Santa Claus that we have is a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you go back a hundred years, that Santa Claus is a snapshot in time. If you go back 200 years. So to go back and say, okay, this Santa Claus from 1850, this is Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And we're going to base all our theory on this 1850 Santa Claus that was popular in New York City Mm -hmm. is, it's not going to take you very far. Got it. Um, with that said, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do think there are some really interesting things, uh, to look at. Um, and so I, I would suggest myself that at his core, Santa is a predominantly shamanic figure. Mm -hmm. He is a figure who travels to different worlds. Mm -hmm. He is a magical figure that can do things that other people can't do. Mm -hmm. Um, He does soul flight, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. He flies around the world uh, with his magic reindeer. And uh, there are some interesting books. There's one... um, that for people that are interested yes when santa was a shaman <laughs> yes <laughs> is, is an excellent book okay um and so there there are different things to look at and of course when we think about uh you know christianity and um you know we can argue about you know <laughs> whether santa claus is, is a christian figure or not right. um whoever he is he's based on elements that have been co-opted from a variety of cultures Mm. um but one of the things that that i would suggest right is so santa claus is this midwinter a christmas figure that is essentially associated with the solstice right Mm -hmm. because christmas is essentially you know a a um is essentially a you know attempt by the church to um to bring in pagan people and to you know um i'm losing the word (laughs) but basically co-opt uh pagan imagery and pagan traditions into a christian framework uh, Mm. which is why we see a lot of pagan elements in christmas like the the christmas tree a tree worship Christians never had time for tree worship. This is not something that they're about. Mm-hmm. But if they can use it to bring in, you know, the pagans and the rural people, okay. that's something that they're going to do. And so, so this is one of the places we can look when we look at Christmas and we can look at Santa Claus is we know a lot of these motifs are, are pagan mm-hmm. and come from country folk. Uh, you know, these don't come from the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are you know rural folk traditions so one of the other things 
the events that's associated with the solstice mm -hmm. is what's known as the the wild hunt or the furious host um and there are different permutations of this across europe um but it's this time at the solstice or or following the days after the solstice where uh spirits and magical and supernatural creatures are kind of take to the skies mm. and you know fly through the air and and again it gets difficult to tease things apart a little bit so that the modern ideas about it is that this was a scary event mm. and people would hide in their houses okay and it was bad luck if you got caught up in this wild hunt because you could get abducted or could foretell the, the death of somebody. And there's some suggestion that these sort of dark interpretations of this event were introduced uh, by the church um, to, mm. you know, to demonize these sort of pagan uh, okay. traditions and, and belief systems. Um, but one of the the individuals that often leads this hunt, this mm -hmm. sort of parade through the sky is Odin, who is another shamanic figure uh, from Nordic and Germanic mythology. Okay. And um, so he's kind of the leader of this. And so you can, you can maybe see that there are some similarities or parallels between Odin and Santa Claus okay. as both leading this kind of parade, supernatural mm. parade through the sky during or around the winter mm -hmm. solstice. Um, and, you know, Santa just has his eight reindeer. And I believe the reindeer were introduced by um, Clement Moore who wrote Twas the Night Before Christmas mm -hmm. um, back in the 1800s, uh, before I believe Santa Claus was associated with, with a horse. Um, Odin rides a horse, uh, Sleipnir. Um, and interestingly, right, so this can be one of those connections that becomes potentially magical for, mm -hmm. for the believer. But uh, Sleipnir, uh, the horse has eight legs. Oh. And Santa Claus has eight reindeer. <laughs> okay. But but of course the the reindeer are a later invention. Okay. But then one would ask, well, why are there eight of them? That's true. And so where does this idea of eight come from? And is the author Clement Moore drawing on this sort of European Germanic uh, mythology around Odin? uh you know leading this wild hunt mm -hmm. um and and interestingly uh a lot of the imagery that we have for santa claus and elves um appears to come from the sami people in northern scandinavia and if you look at, at pictures of, of Sammy in their traditional dress mm -hmm. and compare to, you know, any sort of popular depiction of Santa's elves, okay. the, <laughs> the clothing is, is very similar. All right. um, they're mm -hmm. also reindeer herders. Okay. Um, so a lot of these modern sort of Christmas motifs seem to be based on the kind of the Sammy people. Okay where you have you know you've got the elves where they have the the shoes with the curly mm -hmm. toes and uh the brightly colored clothes and the hats wow um and so you know so later go up and look the look up the sam yeah uh, yeah i'll have to do that it's a s-a-a-m-i um and you'll see you know images of the traditional dress and you go this is this is it this is where Santa Claus comes from. Wow. Um, and so then you've got, you know, the elfin clothes, you've got the reindeer. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and you also have a tradition of shamanism within the Sami people as one of these indigenous groups in, in Northern Europe. Um, there is some evidence that the Sami used the fly agaric uh, in their shamanic traditions, but it's, you know, there's one or two accounts um, that haven't really been well corroborated. Um, so it's hard to know exactly, mm. you know, we, we can't say it for a fact. Right. Uh, but there's evidence that it, they did. And of course, the fly garrick is one of the few substances that grows there uh, that would fit the bill for kind of a shamanic mm. plant. Okay. Wow. Um, so now we've got some some different kind of connections. Mm -hmm. some um, influences. We can look at this kind of Germanic Nordic mythology surrounding Odin. We can look at the Sami people mm -hmm. who who are in the same space as kind of the Nordic peoples. Um, and so you can see potentially some cross influences yeah. uh, in some of these mythologies. So what I would say is that the fly agaric is not at the root mm -hmm. of the Santa Claus mythology. Mm -hmm. But I think there is some evidence that it is part of the mythology. Yeah, no, right? I so like that. Yeah, so it's not like the the master key. Mm -hmm. um, but there are suggestions, there are motifs and themes and influences coming into this sort of broad uh, Santa mythos uh, that we now recognize in the 21st century uh, that seems to draw some influences mm. um, that could be connected uh, to wow. the Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting with all of the influences. And I like how you're honest with about don't put it in this category or this category. I think that was very um, a very good approach. And if you like had unlimited funds, do you think you would want to look into kind of more of the history or are you okay with where we're at and um, <laughs> stuff like that? I think, I mean, I would be interested to, to trace uh, the connections between Santa Claus and, and Odin further. Mm, okay. That's um, so one of the things that, uh, one of the other popular myths about mm -hmm. the fly agaric um, that similarly has this kind of, uh, similarly the center of a kind of passionate debate um, is the berserkers. Okay. Who are Viking warriors from around the ninth to 10th century. Um, who would go into this kind of berserker rage okay. where they are uh, super powerful and kind of, you know, invincible. Um, and it was proposed in the 1700s that the berserkers were consuming the fly agaric. Mm. And so this has now become a, a, a contentious point where people you know, again, are, you know, it's true or it's false and there's no middle ground. Got it. So, so to weave a little more complexity here yes. is the berserkers are connected very closely to Odin. Okay. Uh, the berserkers are Odin's warriors. Got it. Okay. And, and in some permutations of the wild hunt, it's Odin and his berserker warriors that are going through the sky. Mm. So there's these, this other layer of connection yeah. uh, if you are connecting them to a shamanic figure like Odin or you know, then Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. um, so, Gordon Wasson, who I mentioned earlier, was the first to kind of dismiss this theory. Mm -hmm. And he said, there's no evidence that anybody who, you know, takes this mushroom is going to, you know, get violent and go kill people. Mm -hmm. um, 
And of course, we know that Wasson was very thorough in his studies of the historical record and that he had access to and had read accounts that had suggested that in Siberia, it had been used uh, in that way. Okay. Um, so for some reason, he chose to ignore or or hide or or minimize this. Um, and of course, it was the late, you know, 60s at the time. And, you know, the, the drug war was kind of just starting to amp up. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some sense that maybe he's trying to create a protective bubble for this mushroom to, mm-hmm. you know, to keep it away. Um, and I think he did the same with uh, John Allegro, who came out with a book a few years later, um, who argued that the mushroom was, you know, central to Christianity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Wasson kind of said, you know, let's not go there. We don't, this is not something, <laughs> this is not something we want to do because, you know, whatever the facts are, this is not going to be a winning yes. argument in, mm-hmm. in the public sphere. Um, so there's some sense that maybe he was trying to uh, protect. Um, so one of the things we know from the mushroom is that it does uh, seem to have pain-killing properties. Okay. Uh, and that people under the influence of the mushroom, uh, particularly people who've taken high doses, Mm -hmm. uh, will often the next day discover, you know, cuts or abrasions (laughs) or, you know. I'm so sore. (laughs) Right, exactly. You know, they've been kind of in the zone. They don't know Mm -hmm. what they're doing. Um, And they're just not aware that they're, you know, sustaining injuries during these activities. Uh, The other thing we know uh, from Siberia is that the people would use small amounts of it uh, for basically purposes of endurance, you know, so reindeer herders would take it and it would allow them, you know, to follow the herd all day to keep up with them. Um, Women who are weaving would take it so they can sit for long periods of time. Wow. And, and they're also doing monotonous activities, right? right? So they're taking something that is giving the, them the physical endurance, <laughs> but also potentially the mental endurance yes. because their activities become more interesting. Oh, okay. Um, and there are also stories of people, you know, carrying a hundred bag pound of, you know, flour for 10 miles or something, Whoa. you know, which is just, an amazing like I would never do no. that and if I did I you know would probably be bedridden for like a week yes uh, <laughs> um you know wow. so there are these kind of accounts and you know that that's kind of a famous account from several hundred years ago mm-hmm. um you know there's potential that it, it's you know exaggerated uh but within that tale, whether it's exaggerated or not, mm-hmm. is this emphasis on the ability uh, to give people either strength or endurance. Mm. Wow. Um, and then the final aspect of it is this idea of fearlessness. So we, we talked earlier uh, about the anti-anxiety properties mm-hmm. of the mushroom. And... So for shamans that use the mushroom, there's two, there's two things really that are important is one is that the mushroom opens up access, you know, to this otherworldly space, Mm -hmm. but two, it also reduces the fear of the shaman. So Mm -hmm. the shaman now has the resolve to go meet those spirits that he needs to meet who may not be nice spirits, yeah, right? Um, because being, I'm not a shaman, but being a shaman is not necessarily, you know, easy work. Mm-hmm. Um, I can imagine. And so there's this idea of, of kind of fearlessness or courage, mm. uh, or in modern terms, we think of it more in terms of 
anti-anxiety, right? Just not, <laughs> just not being super fearful and anxious yes. about something. Uh, but this idea of imparting courage. So when you look at the berserkers who are described as being, you know, fearless uh, and impervious to pain mm -hmm. and having, you know, the strength of, of 10 men, right? You know, uh, yeah. clearly there's exaggeration going on. But when you look at the properties of the mushroom, they really line up. Mm. Um, so I, I think people are really quick to dismiss it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just being, you know, absolutely honest and straightforward is, you know, we'll never have, we'll never have the physical evidence mm -hmm. um, to suggest that it was, or, you know, to, to make it, to prove the theory, right? Got it, yeah. Um, but I, but I think, I think it deserves a lot more consideration uh, than it gets. And I think um, there is a desire from, um, you know, I'll just say from the believers, mm -hmm. right, to cherry pick the things that support their belief. And there's a desire from the skeptics mm -hmm. to cherry pick the things that support their belief. Right. And so then the problem is that we never have any dialogue or investigation mm -hmm. about what the what we do know. Uh, so nothing nothing productive ever develops because you have people who are stuck in their camps. Yep. And they have their cherry picked data, and they're not gonna they're not gonna dialogue right. about this. Wow. So, so I think there's a, a lot there and I, I particularly interested in, you know, kind of the, the Odin and, and Santa connections and, mm -hmm. and just one more, um, item that I had was that yeah. the, the wild hunt is it's often led by Odin and kind of Germanic and, and Nordic cultures, mm -hmm. but depending on the region, it can be led by different historical figures or mythical figures okay in some places it's king arthur who leads the hunt oh but in some places it's krampus okay uh, yes who is also one of these mythological christmas figures mm -hmm. uh so then you have a specific christmas connection to the wild oh, hunt interesting right? yeah we're, we're not necessarily a christmas connection but a more of a Santa mythos yes. connection. Okay. Um, and then another just interesting story about the wild hunt is there are obviously many different variations on the story. Uh, but in one of them, as Odin is riding his eight-legged horse, mm -hmm. Sleipnir, um, you know, the horse is in such a fury that it's, you know, foaming at the mouth and it has blood in its mouth mm -hmm. and so this saliva you know gets ejected from its mouth and where it lands on the ground it's you know red and white red blood and white saliva mm -hmm. the fly agaric grows oh and so the fly agaric is growing from the spittle of slepnir which is uh -huh. a horse and to make this even more interesting, <laughs> uh, the cosmic tree in Nordic mythology, mm -hmm. and of course, the cosmic tree is important to any shamanic cosmology because it connects the three worlds, the lower world, the human world, and the upper world. Okay. The shamanic tree, and I'll probably pronounce it wrong, but the name for it is Yggdrasil. Yes. Okay. And Yggdrasil translates as Odin's horse or as Odin's steed. Whoa. Okay. But then if you think about the tree as being Slepnir, mm -hmm. then the mushroom is growing at the feet of the tree, mm -hmm. which would then be a representation of that mycorrhizal relationship yeah. between the cosmic tree and the mushroom. 
Wow. That's <laughs> so, really cool. So it's interesting. I mean, so you can kind of dig yourself into holes making these connections. Yeah. And and it really requires some some discussion and some kind of unpeeling of the layers to think about, okay, what are the connections that we think are important mm -hmm. and which are the ones that are just kind of fantastic or <laughs> or or um coincidental. Yes, an ironic coincidence or something like that. Right. Hmm. So, so there's lots of layers there to unpeel. And I and I think it's worth doing the unpeeling. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not saying that those are true concrete connections, mm -hmm. but but they raise interesting questions. Yeah, there's definitely different aspects that come together. And so it's it is something to think about, definitely. Right. Right. Hmm. So what does like the future look like for the fly agaric then? What is like a modern day kind of look like with this mushroom? That's a, I mean, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think some of the interesting things that are happening now mm -hmm. is we have a lot of uh, research currently into the therapeutic potential of okay. different psychedelic substances. Mm -hmm. Um, and as I said before, the, the flag Garrick has long been considered kind of a, a second tier or even third tier substance mm -hmm. within kind of the, the psychedelic community, if you will. And it also continues to widely be considered uh, as a poisonous mushroom uh, globally and particularly with, you know, in the mycological world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stigma, I think, around the mushroom that prevents uh, exploration into its potential mm. therapeutic applications. Okay, yeah. Um, but it's interesting because I believe or I sense that this has applications in ways that other psychedelic substances don't. So for psilocybin, you're looking at, you know, uh, the, the therapy happens when somebody is taken uh, a sufficient dose to have a, a psychoactive or psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest with the fly agaric that the therapeutic benefit happens before you get to that level. Okay. Right. So somebody who's using it in an anti-anxiety uh, medication isn't very uh, effective if you are, you know, tripping balls <laughs> the whole time. Yes. Right? You're not right. getting the result that you want. Right. You've yes. got to go give a public speech somewhere. You don't mm -hmm. want to be you don't want those butterflies in your tummy. You don't want to feel like you're going to vomit. But yes. you also don't want to be distracted by yeah um, <laughs> that would be hard <laughs> right so it so it would be sort of a counterproductive use mm -hmm. um but in in small amounts uh it could have a benefit uh mm -hmm. as an anti-anxiety um it could potentially have a benefit in weaning people off of mm -hmm. you know benzodiazepines or yeah. um alcohol withdrawal things like that and you know, and I, you know, I'm not saying people should go ahead and go do these things because mm -hmm. um, we don't really have the studies on it. Um, but what I am suggesting is that there is potential here, um, and that it should be taken seriously mm -hmm. because these are both areas um, that we haven't had a lot of success in the medical field. Yeah. Um, so I think we need we need to use the tools that we have available uh, or potentially have available. Mm -hmm. And I, I know there are a couple companies uh, in Canada that are working on developing a product that could potentially be used for, um, you know, maybe for anxiety or insomnia, wow. uh, things like that. So I think there are some potential applications Um I think we're going to see some movement in this area in the next few mm -hmm. years. Um, and of course, it'll have to be slow and cautious um, 
because you know it has to be um controlled and and things can be things can get pretty wild if yeah. um if people aren't cautious about uh how much is is being used right right and i mean i know some states are opening up to like the psychedelics of um, other mushrooms too so it will it will take some time i think but um yeah that is interesting that's all it, they have to treat it differently but like it's thought of kind of similar to certain people so it is hard yeah and i think mm-hmm. uh, you know part of it is the um you know the the marketing and you know so if you are selling it as a tincture yeah well, then you have to think about you know, if some kid drinks the whole bottle of tincture, then what do we do? Yeah, (laughs) that's true. Yep. You know, because then what are, what are the liability issues? What is going to be the, you know, the, um, what's going to be kind of the public and legal reactions? Yeah. And, you know, it could be, well, the product isn't intended to be used that way, um, but invariably, Mm -hmm things like that are going to happen. So then those are all considerations that need to be um, taken. And just the one other aside is that there was a product, uh, Gaboxidol, that was developed about 15 to 20 years ago. I forget what pharmaceutical uh, company developed it, but it was modeled off of Muscomol. Mm -hmm. And of course you model it off of it because Mm. if you invent the molecule then you can patent it and make a bunch of money yes yes um and they they tested it uh i think they were testing it for uh, insomnia and they 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 pulled it because they found that um that people enjoyed it too much (laughs) so so you think about the gosh, you know, you see all these commercials for products uh, on TV or online and, you know, the people are floating through the clouds or whatever. And then at the end that, you know, there's this whispering voice that tells you about, you know, the product may, you know, cause suicidal ideation or it could, you know, cause a heart attack mm-hmm. or it could cause, you know, all these things. And so you think about, okay, so the side effect from gaboxidol was that people liked it too much? <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, so in, in terms of side effects, uh, I, I would certainly take that over suicidal ideation. Yes, definitely. <laughs> wow. Hmm, that is interesting. I look forward to what the future holds for um, certain psychedelics because that will be an interesting world. Certainly, certainly. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have anything going on like in the future for you, Kevin, or are you working on anything currently? <laughs> um, we've got a couple couple potential projects, um, but nothing kind of concrete uh, at the moment. Nice. So uh, I guess to be determined. <laughs> okay. Well, awesome. Um, I have some last questions that I usually ask all my guests. Um, how can flora and fungi as a whole influence the future? Okay. Uh, I think that's a great question. Um, and it's a super, I mean, it's a super broad question. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are so many kind of variables and, and dynamics at play in the world right now. Um, you know, ideally, I would hope that there can be some kind of returning, returning to roots, uh, to sort of self-sustaining communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how we get there mm-hmm. from here. Um, but I think, you know, if people are, are invested in, in building relationships with, you know, plants and, and fungi in their community, and building relationships with one another, um, I think we can start building communities uh, that work together mm-hmm. um, to maybe reduce our our reliance on some of the things that are uh, bringing a little too much kind of chaos and pollution uh, to the world. Um, 
you know, like I said, I, I don't know how we get there, but hopefully yeah. with a lot of, you know, dedicated and imaginative and innovative people, mm -hmm. um, we can start coming up with some solutions that are, that are for the people uh, instead of uh, for the super elite uh, who yeah. seem to benefit from most of the um, pseudo solutions that, mm. that we are given. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that kind of goes into my next one. How can people get more involved with flora and funga? Kind of like having that teamwork and like working together, great minds um, to make a better future for everyone. It's kind of yeah. What it and like. I'm, you know, I'm still, you know, still trying to think about how that happens. I mean, I think it happens at the local level. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think we need to have kind of a, a social reckoning in the next few years about, yeah. uh, about how we communicate and how we form communities. Yeah. Um, at, at this point, my feeling is that social media has by and large been kind of a, a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, I think there have been benefits to it. I know that I have personally benefited from it. Yes. But it's also um, just been by and large, a kind of a toxic influence uh, on our culture. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I don't know that we throw, you know, the baby out with the bathwater. Um, you know, I, I think there may be ways that this can be, uh, funneled into a yeah. more positive and productive uh, direction. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, how, do we get know, there? <laughs> how do we, how do we get there? Yep. That's a um, good point. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's, again, it's going to take a lot of creativity and, and persistence and um, people finding ways to, to create healthy communities. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I, I know I, I participate in a lot of online communities and I, I get benefit from them, but there's also a lot of toxicity uh, running through them. Yeah. Yeah. We will leave the listeners with that question. How, how can we get there? Definitely. Um, besides the, your book and the, what was it? When Santa was a shaman, do you have any other resources um, that you want to share with people? Yeah. <laughs> so so this oh, is yes. my book, which is the Fly Agaric, which yes, is it's a big boy. Uh, it's not really my book. Is a, you know a couple dozen people mm -hmm. uh, contributed uh, to the book to make it happen, um, and then this one is a great one for the holidays when yes. Santa was a shaman. <laughs> um, I mentioned Clark Einrich's book earlier, which is a great one that talks a lot about Fly Agaric. Okay. Um, and a lot of Gordon Wasson's work is, is really interesting. And I believe his book, Soma, which is, explores the connections between fly agaric and, um, and the ancient uh, Indian sacrament, Soma, mm -hmm. uh, is, has recently been republished and I think is available. Um, also incredibly interesting reading. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast. And this was really fun. And I love learning all about this. I'll definitely have to read the book and just kind of dive deep into certain categories that I want to learn more. Sounds good. Well, yeah. thank you so much uh, for having me on here yes. and uh, wish you a happy holidays. Yes, thank you. You too. Anything else that uh, I didn't mention or any other questions? Uh, not at the moment, um, but would love to chat with you again sometime awesome. in the future. So just yes. let me know. Yeah, we'll have to catch up. All right. Well, I hope you have a good holidays and have a good rest of your day. All right. Thank you so much. All right. See ya. Thanks. Take care.